Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network Team consists of Carl Frank of AI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network Team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. And we encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Welcome to today's podcast. Thanks for joining us. My name is Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney with the law firm Goodspeed Merrill. And I'm here with Carl Frank, uh, financial advisor extraordinaire with AI Financial. Carl? Hey, Nate. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to talk. Hey, you know, um, and it's just part of our habit that, that our company rebranded ourselves here in 2023. We're now calling ourselves a i Wealth Management because we're working hey. with a smaller number of successful families. a i Wealth Management sounds great. Um, I will uh, log that in the memory and make sure I get it right going forward. So thanks for calling that to my attention. You know, we're um, still a legal we, entity. I think you guys took care of it. I think we're still financial services, but a i Wealth Management is going to be our new brand. And we're excited about it. I'm excited to be in the same building as you. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for letting us be here. Yeah. No worries. Um, it's always great to have good uh, partners to team up with, to rely on, to help our clients get the best results, which is what we're here for today. Um, recently, we talked about some of the, uh, well, this was all past December 29th, because uh, politicians never learned not to procrastinate. Um the uh, tax bill, I guess it was called Secure 2.0 of 2022. We talked uh, last week about some of the 90 provisions that are applicable to individuals, some of them related to uh, retirement savings, retirement uh, withdrawing, and, and, and the like, and some of those individual level considerations. Today, we're going to switch gears to the other side of the coin and talk a little bit about what impacts employers, because um, there's a fair amount of this that also affects the incentives and opportunities for employers and how they interface with retirement savings programs. Um, am I getting that right, Carl? Yeah, you summed it up really well. I, I think employers are going to come out of this podcast just saying, holy cow, the government just made things a lot more complicated. And if uh, if an employer does not already have a retirement plan expert to talk to, they're going to want one. So maybe some of these might be a little duplicative, but recognize that maybe everybody doesn't uh, get everything on the first reading. Um you know, we talked last uh, week about the RMDs. Yeah, and, so uh, so if you have a qualified retirement plan, you've got to pull your money after a certain age. And, you know, last week we talked about it, having to do it in the 1950s. If you're born between 51 and 59, you got to pull out at age 73. You know, another way to think about that is that if you're age 73 in the year 2022, then you have to pull it out after the year 2022. And if you're age 75, after the year 2032, you have to pull it out. Otherwise, your required distance, to, if you're <laughs> younger than that, if you're old, already over that age today, then you're already pulling it out at age 72. Right. And the penalties were adjusted down where it looks like they're getting a little more understanding of non-compliance now that they're really shaking up how and when and how much. So yeah, that's... I, that's I a good thing to see. 
I guess they're more forgiving, Nate. I mean, what do you think about that? Is that a possibility? Maybe they can't even figure it out. And so they're just basically saying, if you can't, if we can't, you can't, that's all good. We're not going to hit you. We're not going to hit you over the heart too much on that. One of the things you mentioned last week, and it looks like there's an employer related component to this, which is catch up provisions being required to be Roth contributions, but it looks like uh, matching contributions. Um, can yeah. be are permitted to be made strictly on right. a Roth basis. Right. So if you if you've got an, a, a company plan where you're putting in a match or any sort of employer contribution, it used to be, and will be the case uh, through this calendar year 2023, that you can only put it in on a pre-tax basis. But beginning in 2024, all these rules take place January 1, 2024. We have a year to figure this out. Uh, then you can put those into the Roth. So that's good news. I mean, now you're going to have a choice. So my next question is, what is a QLAC and why should I care? Yeah, a qualified a QLAC is a qualified lifetime annuity contract. And this is an interesting idea because a lot of companies like these things. Um, so if somebody has a really good lobbyist and got it into the government. Um, it's definitely something where you were not able to do this inside your 401k before. Uh, but now inside your qualified plan, you can start to offer lifetime annuity contracts, which are going to be similar to what folks used to have a long time ago called a pension, where every year you're alive, your company would pay you an income. Uh, now the company can do something similar, but it's not going to be the company that's paying you. You are going to pull your money out put it into an annuity company who's an expert at paying you and you're going to get a lifetime annuity contract from them straight out of your 401k. So is this, you know, is this something that people would usually do like as they're proceeding to retirement, it wouldn't be something a 25 year old would allow would as be, an investment option. Well, yeah, unless they're an NFL or, you know, pro athlete who got retired early and is a real foolhardy person with their own money and just needs a lifetime income. Uh, yeah, no, the rest of us, we're not going to do this. So we'll, we'll, we'll do the market based investments up to the point where we move to retirement and then maybe we have some of our balance moved into a QLAC. Yeah. And hopefully everybody talks to a qualified financial planner, you know, certified financial planner to, to make the right decision for their own unique situation. So one thing I've always struggled with, Carl, is how do I get my young employees to want to participate in a 401k plan? Is the government going to help me solve that problem this year? <laughs> yeah, it's called bribery, Nate. <laughs> how exactly hey, does that work hey young person if you contribute to your 401k plan i'll give you a starbucks card i'll give you a low dollar gift card how weird is that and you can start with that right now in 2023 you can start bribing your employees to contribute to their retirement plans <laughs> with low dollar gift cards the government did not define what low dollar means um so good luck with that one yeah, I still don't know if it's going to work, but uh, we'll see the power of Starbucks. Let's see, see what kind of results we can get. Right. And if I'm the smart employee, I'll say, sure, I'll put $5 in my plan. You give me a $20 gift card to wherever, and then I'll stop contributing next month. So given that I don't do a lot of work in the, in the qualified plan space, I know you work with a lot of uh, businesses in terms of managing or helping to manage and and uh conceive of their 401ks um the provisions that relate to startup credits for small employers um yeah this tell is me really, about these this is really important in colorado now small employers have to start providing retirement plans for their employees and this is a federal law that made it easier for um, companies to to start up their retirement plans so you're getting tax credits for the uh, for companies that are have 50 or fewer in place. So that's pretty great. And also there's a whole lot of rules about in small employers with less than 100 employees to um, uh, to get these tax credits. So it's kind of nice. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's the carrot and the stick in Colorado where they've got a you know, a stick and the federal government is giving us a carrot to make it a lot easier. So but these have to be new plans, right? Yeah. So this would be for companies that, you know, startup companies or um, companies that don't already have a plan uh, are going to be forced to have a plan if their home base is Colorado. And then the government, the federal government is giving us tax credits, coincidentally, 
at the same time that they're being forced to do it here in Colorado. Goes back to that uh, concept we discussed a little last time is uh, is the giving away money and taking money. I here it appears that we have a uh, a little bit of giving away to get a future benefit in terms of uh, increased employee savings. Oh yeah, um, right, exactly. That, that it's all about the government making money now, and and this is a. a quid pro quo. And, you know, if I were a, um, an optimist, I'd say that the government's just looking out for our best interests. There you go. Oh, I, I, I like that idea. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to move on to one of um, the items that's near and dear to my heart. This is something we're uh, looking at doing um, for any uh, small employer who's been the trustee or the fiduciary on their plan and understand kind of what that exposes them to and what their responsibilities are. This is something that for me personally has become a a 2023 effort, which is the uh, changes or enhancements to multi-employer plans, but also the pooled employer plans. Um, For me, these become interesting because they allow you to basically offload that fiduciary responsibility as a small employer and um, and participate in purchasing power of a much larger organization, getting in different opportunities and that sort of thing. So maybe Carl, you can speak a little bit to this. Yeah, just real quickly. I mean, you know, a, a, an advantage of of these multiple employer plans or pool plans is that uh, you've got more money in the plan. So as a general rule, each different company that's a part of it uh, may have a lower overall cost, and so there can be some efficiencies in scale. Um, the plan is going to be a little more cookie cutter, and so you're not going to get a lot of customization. And if the new rules clarified made it pretty clear that in a pooled employer plan that you can name a fiduciary for the handling of the money. That And that's a really big deal because, you know, moving money uh, out of the company account to your employee, you're a fiduciary. And it's the same thing if you're moving money into the employee's retirement plan, you're named fiduciary for that. If there's any hanky-panky um, that goes on there, and there has been in the past, uh, you can name somebody else as being responsible for that. So that's a good thing. Right. I'm going to give you a quick opportunity to go to highlight again for interested listeners. Uh, Carl, you and I covered this in greater detail in a previous podcast, but uh, Roth provisions and and specifically perhaps those that impact employers. We love the Roth, uh, you know, go tax free. You contribute money after tax. It grows tax free. And when you pull it out, you don't pay any income taxes on it. So I've been a long time proponent of the Roth ever since they first came out. The now employers are going to be able to put money in on behalf of their employees on a Roth basis and employees who have who are over the age of 50, like the two of us and and actually probably all of us on on the expert network team. um, uh, Now we have to put our catch up contributions so folks over age 50 get to contribute a little bit more to their retirement plan. And if you're making more than $145,000 a year, then you have to put your money in your catch-up contribution in on a Roth basis. Um, you know, you and I talked about the reasons why last they time. They want the tax now. Imagine that. <laughs> I can't believe it. The other thing that's really cool is that obviously the contributions, you can decide whether you want it to go into the Roth. A weird set of complications, though, a downside to this is that these matching contributions, if employees are making student loan payments, employers can say, oh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and match whatever you're paying for your student loans. And that could be a way, I guess, for employers to say, come and join my company. You know, it's an incentive. It's a different benefit that I can give you. And so the employer would be able to do that on a pre-tax basis. The employee wouldn't have to pay income tax on that contribution and the money would go to the college. So imagine the lobbyists and who they actually work for that got that signed. Well, yeah, boy, that's a rabbit hole for me because it seems to disincentivize people to actually pay for schools they go. But I guess the- Well, the, in my mind. The, 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 the the reality of it is, unfortunately, schools got so expensive that perhaps nobody can really make it through without some sort of borrowing along the way. But uh, either way, interesting provision. Yeah, um, really benefit to provision. 
Um, let's see here. Um, oh, one more thing about the Roth. In, yeah. it, this is a weird rule that a lot of people didn't know. Uh, Roth IRAs never have a required minimum distribution. So in a traditional IRA where you've got tax deferral, the government forces you to pull it out. We talked about that at the beginning of the podcast. But Roth 401ks used to have a required distribution. Now that's gone. So now Roth 401ks uh, are just like Roth IRAs. You're not forced to pull money out after the age of 72, 73, or 75. So that's a good thing. So I'm looking at something here. Uh, perhaps you can um, educate me. Uh, emergency savings accounts as part of a retirement plan? Blowing my mind again, right? Why did they do this? It's so little money and it's so complex and players are definitely going to want to have an expert person to, to navigate this with them. Uh, but now they get to have, uh, not unlike what you were talking about in a previous podcast where you have a tax-free savings account, it's only allowed to be $2,500. It's going to be linked to your 401k or other pension retirement account, account, but you can pull it off for any reason. It's your emergency savings account. Uh, it's taxed like a Roth. So you're going to put money in there. They're going to tax you on their way in, but they're never going to tax it again. And you can pull it out for any, uh, any reason. In theory, you can do this in the year 2023. Uh, you know, there's going to be a whole lot of conversations about how they're actually going to implement that and how what a headache it's going to be and how they're going to make it make it work. But that's interesting. So now that you do have an emergency savings account inside of your long term retirement account, and these are elective. So it's not like every employer has to consider putting these things in. It's it's a yeah, plan it, design question, correct? Or you got it. And from from our point of view, what a headache. Right. Yeah. We're going to recommend that you don't do it. Well, it kind of goes back to something I mentioned in our last podcast. It's like some of these things we look at and see come through these bills. It's like, I don't remember this being a problem. You know, that the, the government the, right. that I was just itching to say, gosh, if the government would only solve yeah. emergency savings accounts Thanks. up to 2500 then all of our problems would be solved. Woo. Well, gosh, good thing we got the government to guard our backs. Yeah. So what it's just interesting sometimes when things like this show up, like you said, who, which lobby was behind this and why? Um, exactly. I'm not a cynic. Um, no. Rollovers from 529s, we addressed this a little bit. Do you want to hike, uh, give a recap of that? Well, yeah. I mean, this is a great new perk. So, you know, 529 plans for education purposes, as long as you pulled the money out for education, it was great. It was all tax free. Uh, now you can roll that 529 plan into a Roth IRA. It can be your Roth IRA. It can be another person's Roth IRA. Uh, it can be great. And it's 35 grand. So that's a huge benefit um, uh, that makes those that way of saving for college much more appealing. Awesome. And what's the cash out limit? So employers who have employees who don't hang around a long time or only oh. had up to $5,000 in their retirement plan, uh, it's a real headache for the employer to keep that plan on the books forever. And so there was a limit. If it was less than $5,000 and the employee they never acted on out. it, they could force you out. That limit's been increased to $7,000. So now employers can force out people who have less than $7,000. Uh, Ex-employees who, right. who have not been responsive can be forced out with less than $7,000 in their retirement account. So here's here's one that I know, you know, I'll I'll be honest on this. I think I've the the school of thought or those who like it and don't like it are almost split down the middle. But um the auto enrollment and auto escalation. So Daniel Kahneman is the founder, he's a he's a psychologist who made a Nobel Prize uh winning set of essays and lifetime of research um investigating economics. And, and one of his findings was that employees who are automatically enrolled into their company's retirement plans saved more money. And that employees who also uh, were automatically, their contributions were automatically increased by say 1% per year, every year that they worked, saved more money in their retirement plans. And so this became, and it's, and it's a groundbreaking research, but it's now 20 years old and it did win a Nobel prize among the other things Daniel did. Um, has proven that, you know, these people will have a little more in their retirement accounts. So now the government's making it so that new plans are required 
and this would be 401k or a charity, would be required to adopt these two provisions. Old plans are grandfathered in, uh, but I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if they start to make it so that all plans have to do that. Again, this is one of those rules that takes place in the year 2024. We've got a few months to figure out how we're going to plan for that. Beginning after 2024. When yeah, you say meaning after. the calendar year 2024. Yep. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, let's see. Lastly, uh, catch up amounts for individuals. We, we went over this in the last podcast as well. 60, 61, 62, and 63 starting in year 2025. Yeah. How we weird get, is that? Yeah. Well, they're targeting a demographic clearly. And, um, and then the lowering of the threshold for employees in, uh, 401ks and 403bs making it easier i guess yeah so this is a big one this is a big one for us and this is what um you'll see if you do decide to go with a pooled employer plan or multiple employer plan for your company is you won't be in control of this anymore Mm -hmm. um one of the things we do in a customized 401k plan is we decide what's right for the company and namely the employer but now, beginning in 2024, um, you know, to prohibit somebody from joining the plan for a couple of years or prohibit somebody from having, say, 2,000 hours of work a year before they could join the 401k plan is going to be prohibited. And it's going to be 500 hours or for two consecutive years, then they're going to be allowed to, into the plan. You're not going to be able to prohibit them anymore. And, and so for some employers, person. that could be a big deal, right? If you're yeah. hiring a lot of temporary workers, a lot of seasonal workers, um, you're not going to be able to do what you used to be able to do, which is say, oh, I don't want to do all this headache for somebody who's not going to contribute much anyway. Now you have to let them in. Interesting. Yeah, well, and you so, know, you know, on the good news side of that is that now these people who didn't used to be able to get into a retirement plan can. True. And I can't help but think some of these, you know, we've talked about these demographic tranches and the interesting nuances about contributions, withdrawals, all that stuff. It seems like some of these, these more recent ones that we went over in terms of prospective plan design, if I was to infer or analyze it from a policy political perspective is it looks like they're trying to engage the millennial workforce a little differently than maybe they have prior generations. So they're seeing a need there or a different approach that might engage those workers in saving for retirement. Because, you know, we've talked about it in other podcasts, the the unique attributes of the broader millennial demographic and, and in some cases the wise is they're not saving for a home. They're not saving, they may not even be saving for retirement. They're saving for experiences and memories and different sorts of things, according to the literature. So maybe this is just a, a counter effort there to help them ease into adulthood and, and mature in a way that they're not programmed to do otherwise. You know, that's I my that's my that philosophy minute for today's uh, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> and it's very optimistic and friendly. And it's you know, my my opposite side of that, or not quite opposite side of that, just the bitter side of it would be, well, you know, the Congress people are boomer age and their kids are millennial age. And so they're, you know, they got to get these kids off the couch. Well, they got to get them off their own dole too. I mean, again, that, okay, now you brought out the cynic in me, which is they don't want it. They don't want to be paying for their kids into their retirement, let alone, yeah. you know. None of us do. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we covered, again, a heavy load of meaty tax here. So hopefully yep. this was helpful to, to everyone, our listeners out there. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I think that the, the majority of the work falls on the employer for these 401k plans. And that's a bummer. But, um, you know, you're considering going in a route that seems I think a lot of people may start to consider, which is just to pool with other multiple employers. Uh, you'll lose some control and there'll be a lot of um, rules that you might not like, but you'll at least you won't have to worry about the headache. And other folks may choose the other direction, which is no, 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 no. I want I, I need to maintain control. And I, in any event, it's going to be so complex. Everybody's going to want an expert. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with at what level the 401k or the retirement plan is um, a uh, inducement or an asset in terms of attracting talent and retaining talent. 
excuse me, you know, when when you're in a, a professional services firm, I wouldn't say that the the large portion of those folks are um they're, you know, our professionals are coming in for the opportunity partnership track, that sort of thing. Um, they're not usually fully induced just based on the uh, the retirement savings plan, whereas um, some of our staff level employees, it might be, a, you know, a much bigger inducement to them. And, and as you say, uh, we're losing some of the design features to that, but the defaults tend to be favorable to employees rather than employers. Like you were saying about the, the hourly, you know, and I can live with that based on our workforce to offload that fiduciary obligation and sleep a little better at night. And, and Nate, you and I know, I mean, and I love the service example, but in other types of industries too, it could be completely different. And certainly in technology yeah. industries where you could get a stock option or a restricted stock unit or something, and it could be qualified and not taxed, it could be great. You talked about qualified small business stock, uh, you know, an ESOP or employee stock option, you know, stock ownership plan could be a really exciting way for that company to, uh, you know, those types of companies or anybody deal with the that. higher tiers or even, even the, you know, an ESOP is oh, yeah. that's, that's employee Everybody. owned from the janitor to the CEO. So. Exactly. And it might not work in all industries, but it could be something that other companies want to uh, consider. And, and, you know, those are just a few of the offhand examples of what an employer can do to, um, you know, to get benefit out of, what on the surface, especially after these 90, 90 plus tax laws that just took place made everything more complex, um, you know, they, they might be looking at it and say, oh my gosh, why would I touch this? And, and, and the benefits, you, know, you want to have somebody help you make the benefits uh, maximized uh, for, for all participants. Yeah. So closing thoughts, Carl. You know, bottom line, from my point of view, you know, our team, you know, we're, we're, it took a lot of work for us to, you know, to get to stay ahead of this for employers who already have a whole lot of things going on in a, in a world that may be in recession. Um, you want to find a, a team like that. And, and Nate, you, you and I have been doing these podcasts for a couple of years now. I think we're, we're coming close to our second anniversary, aren't we? Uh, very close, actually. I remember uh, sitting in our office over on uh, Union. Mm -hmm. Talking about estate planning just about this time of year because it was pre-COVID. Isn't that amazing? I mean, oh my, oh my goodness, friend. It, you know, we, we, I've learned so much from you, and and I hope you've learned a little bit from me and and all the members of the expert team. So Absolutely. we've got, yeah, I think you know we're just hitting our stride here in 2023. It's going to be the best year ever. Awesome. Well, on that note, we will uh, bid adieu until next time. Make it a great day. Have a beautiful day. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else and join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at, at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal investment or accounting advice. And the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through a Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.